Hi class, I wanted to give you um, some more detail about analytic continuation and I wanted to use an example involving the gamma function. So let me remind you that analytic continuation is the statement that given any function f of x of a real variable x that has a convergent Taylor series expansion about some point x equals x0, there is a unique analytic continuation, that is we can go from f as a real function of x to generalize it to f as a function of z for complex z. Now, why is it that it's possible to do that? Well, the basic idea is that if, it's, uh, if the function f of x has a convergent Taylor series expansion, we have an expansion like this, which is true in a neighborhood of the point x0, between x0 minus r and x0 plus r, where r is the radius of convergence. By just taking x in this expression and changing it to z, we automatically get a convergent Taylor series expansion in the complex plane, which, has a, which, com which converges in a circle, a disk like that, um, of f as a function of the, of the complex variable z. Um, so the basic point is that an analytic function f of x is determined entirely by its Taylor series coefficients, but those Taylor series coefficients uniquely define an analytic continuation. So let's take a particular example. Let's take the function gamma of x. Gamma of x is defined as this integral, the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus t, t to the x minus 1 dt. It's defined for any real value of x greater than 0. If we take x equal to 0, we see that because of the dt and the t to the 0 minus 1 here, it would actually diverge at x equals 0. So the only problem with um, this representation of the gamma function, at least for real values of x, is that it diverges for any x less than or equal to 0. To, if you haven't seen the gamma function before, it's actually very closely related to things you already know. If you take the gamma function and you integrate by parts, you get this relation that gamma of x is x minus 1 gamma of x minus 1. So if you use this relation for x equals n plus 1, where n is any integer, you automatically see by using it recursively over and over again, and also if you plug in the fact that gamma of 1 is equal to 1, you'll find gamma of n plus 1 is n factorial for any integer n. So gamma of x generalizes the factorial function to real values of x. So the gamma function is already a continuation in that sense. It continues what we mean by um, integral values of the factorial to some, uh, in fact, analytic function of x. That kind of a continuation is not always unique, um, but we can use this representation and we can actually see if we can define gamma of x um, uh, in the complex plane and do continue, consider the analytic continuation of gamma of z. In fact, there is a continuation and there's a nice integral representation of the continuation of gamma to the complex plane, and it's the Henkel representation. This is a slightly different form than what I wrote down in class the other day, but it is entirely consistent and, um, with that. You define gamma of z as the integral from over this contour, where the contour is defined in the complex s plane, s is the variable of integration, of s to the z minus 1 e to the minus s ds. And because s to the z minus 1, for some arbitrary complex value of z, has a branch cut at s equals 0, we have to define what we mean by s to the z minus 1. We do that by, defining, by writing a branch cut along the positive real s axis, a cut going from the origin out to infinity. And our contour comes along the top, value, top of the cut and then goes back to infinity along the bo bottom value of the cut. It turns out that this integral is going to be uh, an analytic continuation of the gamma function up to this overall factor of 1 over e to the 2 pi i z minus 1. And this representation of the gamma function actually is defined for complex z, um, even for complex z with real values of z less than 1. That's because this contour doesn't actually go through the origin. This is that since it doesn't include the origin, the potential divergence we have at the branch point doesn't actually matter. So in order to prove this, that this is actually a representation of the gamma function, we have to show that this is an analytic continuation. That is, we have to show that if we take z equals to a real value x, it agrees with our previous definition of the gamma function. In order to do that, we have to define the branch of this function s to the z minus 1. So remember, we defined it in terms of this branch cut, which means if we want to calculate the integrand here at some complex value of s, then if we call the radius t, for reasons you'll see in a second, we call the angle phi, so the polar representation for this complex S is a radius t and angle phi, g of t e to the i phi is t e to the i phi z minus 1 times e to the minus t i phi, where phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. 
Now consider z on the real axis just above the cut, or actually s on the real axis just above the cut, like we're going to do right here. Then s could be written as t times e to the i times 0, because the angle over here, according to our branch, the way we've defined the branch cut of uh, s to the z minus 1, that angle is 0. So this just becomes um, t. So g of s is t to the z minus 1, e to the minus t, in that case. Um, below g, below the cut, s is t to the i, e to the i 2 pi, so g of s in that case is t, which is a real number, to the z minus 1, e to the 2 pi i to the z minus 1, e to the minus t, e to the 2 pi i. But e to the 2 pi i times z minus 1 is just e to the 2 pi i z, because e to the 2 pi i times 1 is, is 1. And again, this e to the 2 pi i here is 1. So the whole thing, just below the cut, has the value t to the z minus 1, e to the minus t, times e to the 2 pi i z. Let me deform the contour c that I had, not going over any, uh, any singularities of the function, so that it comes in just above the branch cut to very close to the origin, goes on a very small circle of radius epsilon around the branch cut, and then goes out just below the branch cut. If we then evaluate gamma from that expression that we had before, but we, we, um, we rely on x just greater than, uh, a real value of x greater than zero, then what we see is this is the limit as the radius of this contour goes to zero of the integral from plus infinity down to epsilon of the value just above the cut, which we showed was t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt. And, the value, uh, and, and then this piece going out along the bottom of the cut, which is the integral from epsilon to infinity, e to the 2 pi i x times t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt. That comes from, from right here. And then the, the integral right around this contour here, that's an integral, well, along the contour, s is just epsilon e to the i theta, where theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So this is the integral epsilon e to the i theta x to the x minus 1, e to the minus epsilon e to the i theta, and then d epsilon e to the i theta, that's t to the x minus 1, e to the minus t dt, where t or s is of the form epsilon e to the i theta. Because I have an epsilon to the x minus 1 and an epsilon here, this is overall an epsilon to the x, where epsilon is this positive small number. And remember, we're interested here in values of x greater than 0. So for values of x greater than 0, this is just going to go to 0 as I take epsilon to 0. Now remember that in my definition, in terms of the integral, I had an overall factor of 1 over e to the 2 pi i, in this case z is x, minus 1. Now if you just look at this term and this term, this term gives you minus of our ordinary definition of the gamma function, because it goes from infinity to 0 as epsilon goes to 0. This term gives us the ordinary definition from 0 to infinity, but it has an extra factor of e to the 2 pi i x. So combining this with this, I get e to the 2 pi x minus 1 times the definition that I gave before for the gamma function, divided by this, extra, this denominator which we had introduced. That means that this value, this integral representation of gamma z, equals the ordinary definition of the gamma function for real values of z along the positive axis. Okay, so what we've shown is that this definition, uh, this integral, um, where we define this integral in the complex s-plane of s to the z minus 1 e to the minus s dz, where we define this function as having a branch cut from s equals 0 uh, along the positive real s-axis, and we take a contour which comes in along the top sheet uh, top of the branch cut, go, circles around the branch cut, and goes out to infinity along the bottom. If we evaluate this integral and divide by e to the 2 pi i z minus 1, then for any real positive z, for any, po any z that's equal to x, a real number greater than 1, it's equal to our conventional definition of the gamma function. But this expression, as we've explained, since we never actually integrate at the origin, is perfectly well defined for any complex value of z any complex value of z, including those with real values of z less than zero. So this is the Hankel integral representation of the gamma function. It's a way of getting an analytic continuation of the ordinary definition of the gamma function to any complex values of z. In fact, if you analyze this expression, or even this expression, a little better, you can, sh you can actually see that it um, uh, has poles at negative values of in at the integers along the real axis or at, at uh, x equals 0. So that's something that you should check. Now, just to recap, this has been an example of analytic continuation. We had an expression for the function that made sense for positive values of x. We have been able to find another expression that makes 
sense for complex value z, which reduces to this one, where the, this representation is valid. So this is an analytic continuation. It was a way of defining, uh, give it, letting, introducing the gamma function, which is an important function in mathematical physics, and showing you its Henkel representation, which you probably didn't see before. Finally, it was an interesting example of where we had to deal with the branch cut, because we needed to define what we mean by this function s to the z minus 1 times e to the minus s.